Hello everyone and welcome to the Guildford Twinning Association's Autumn Lecture 2020, held here in Guildford's United Reformed Church, to whom we give thanks. Because of coronavirus restrictions, we have only a tiny audience here, but we hope many more online. Welcome to all of you. Now, why this lecture? The Guildford Twinning Association is a voluntary organisation which supports the twinning of Freiburg in Germany with Guildford here in the UK. As part of that support, we aim to educate people here about Freiburg and Germany and their culture. That ties in this year with the 250th anniversary of the birth of Beethoven, one of the most important German cultural figures. And who better to talk about him than Professor Eric Levy, one of Guildford's most important cultural figures. Eric Levy is a distinguished academic musicologist, a pianist, a music broadcaster, a BBC journalist, uh, a BBC broadcaster, and, I'm proud to say, a Guildford resident and a member of the Guildford Twinning Association. He's assisted today by his wife, Jo Levy, a professional cellist, also a member of the Guildford Twinning Association. They will trace Beethoven's development from tradition to innovation through his cello sonatas. Now, let's listen to what Eric has to say. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you to the Twinning Association for inviting us to, to talk and play for you. And of course, for United Reform Church for allowing us to hold a lecture here in this lovely piano. You, you would, might have had an alternative, which would, would have been our very nice flesh tone, but it's a little bit out of tune, so it wouldn't have been so satisfactory as this wonderful piano. Um, a great deal has been written about Beethoven, especially in his anniversary year. Um, I was just looking at book lists before I came out today, and there are at least three new biographies of Beethoven that have appeared in the shops in the last few months. And those of you who've been listening to BBC Radio 3 will have noticed that Composer of the Week every fortnight surveys the minutiae of Beethoven's life. All very fascinating. Our contribution is obviously more modest, um, and it's really a, a, an attempt to look at his place in Western music history. And I want to focus today on the factors that make him so overwhelmingly significant as a composer. Someone who as in the title of my lecture, combines innovation with tradition. It's interesting to reflect on the ways in which other musicians, great musicians in many cases, regarded Beethoven, and the degree to which many were intimidated by his monumental achievement. I want to start by giving you some random quotes that exemplify the point that Beethoven has dominated our musical lives up to the present day. Starting with a quote from Franz Schubert, who was, of course, uh, an Austrian composer of contemporary Beethoven's, uh, much younger. He was so in awe of Beethoven that he sold his school notebooks to, so as to be able to afford to attend the performance of Fidelio. And after hearing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony performed in 1824, he said in a letter to a friend, quote, I secretly hope to achieve something, but who dares to try anything after Beethoven? So there's a sort of element of intimidation about this. And that carried on in the 19th century with the two great figures that followed in the second half of the 19th century, Michel Wagner and Johannes Brahms. And I'll read two quotes from them about Beethoven. First of all, one from Wagner. I quote, I deem Beethoven to be the keystone of the whole great epoch of art, beyond whose limits no man could hope to press and within which no man could attain to independence. Again, showing them as a kind of gigantic force. Johannes Brahms was particularly in awe of Beethoven, and he sniped at the critic when his own first symphony was performed and de uh, declared as Beethoven's tenth. And he said to the critic, you can't have any idea what it's like to always hear such a giant marching behind. I think we can sum up Beethoven's impact by a very recent comment from the BBC TV programme, Being Beethoven, from the conductor Ivan Fischer. And he says, I quote, There are only two types of music, music before and after Beethoven. So, how do we place 
Beethoven in some kind of historical context. It's not a, an easy, a simple task. I'm often asked whether I think of Beethoven as a classical or a romantic artist. Diplomatically, I sit on the fence, saying that he's both. The classical argument would suggest that he inherited the formal, formal and expressive traditions commonly associated with his Viennese forebears, most notably Joseph Haydn and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And he car carried on writing in the classical uh, style, uh, except in classical genres. On the other hand, the romantic Beethoven would argue that he expanded out of all recognition those inherited traditions, so that by the end of his life, in 1827, he pushed forward a musical style way beyond anything that could have been conceived before. <coughs> in fact, Beethoven's music attains such great emotional power and breaks so many conventions that this is precisely what I said before with these composers uh, arguing about how intimidating Beethoven was. Future generation composers became basically intimidated by his legacy. Interestingly enough, the idea of Beethoven as a romantic wasn't some kind of construct of the late 19th century, but actually in his own time. For example, the novelist and musician E.T.A. Hoffman wrote this about the composer. I quote, this is quite a long quote. Thus does Beethoven's instrumental music open for us the realm of the monstrous and the measure. Glowing rays shoot through the deep night of this realm, and we, be, and we become aware of giant shadows that wave up and down, close us in more and more narrowly, and annihilate everything in us except for the pain of infinite yearning, in which every pleasure sinks down and founders, and only in this pain, which consuming within itself, but not destroying, love, hope, and joy wants to burst open our breast with a full-voiced harmony of all passions. Do we live on, enchanted spirits? Beethoven's music sets in motion terror, fear, horror, pain, and awakens the infinite yearning that is the essence, essence of romanticism. So, we can think of Beethoven as both a classical and romantic figure, basically, as a transition, transition figure. Perhaps the dichotomy between the classical and the romantic in Beethoven's music mirrors the turbulent and contradictory times in which he lived. We have to remember, for example, that Beethoven was 19 when the French Revolution broke out, and he was certainly sympathetic to the notion of a revolutionary idea. He was, for example, an early admirer of Napoleon, initially dedicating his heroic symphony to him. But of course, we know from um, the evidence that dedication was crossed out after uh, Napoleon became emperor. Beethoven was disappointed by this turn of events. And later, of course, Beethoven would change his mind towards Napoleon after the French occupation of Vienna. Indeed, he openly celebrated Napoleon's defeat at the hands of Wellington in his orchestral work, Wellington Victory. So, the political turmoil of the period mirrored in cultural terms gradually shifting relationships between the artist and his or her patrons, which were, of course, in the past, the church and the ruling classes. In this respect, in the respect of patronage, Beethoven became a game changer. He regarded patrons not as people who commissioned his work, but as enablers that supported his creative projects, rather than buying into their requirements. So, in point of fact, music becomes increasingly the province of the middle classes as opposed to the aristocracy during the late of his life. Another factor which uh, points to this transition is that individualism and virtuosity take centre stage. The technical demands made of the performers in Beethoven's music becomes ever more challenging, not only in terms of the dexterity and showiness, but also in terms of stamina, because some of Beethoven's music is much longer than works that were written before. In fact, it far outstrips everything in any music that was written before. And hand in hand with this individuality and virtuosity comes the expansion in instrumental technology. We can think here of one instrument in particular, the prototype of a modern piano, the forte piano, which increased its range of notes and power of sonority during Beethoven's lifetime. And Beethoven's 32 piano sonata celebrate that uh, development. You can actually hear how, if you listen from sonata 1 to 32, how the piano is expanded, both in its expressive range and in the notes that are available to the, to the composer. Finally, of course, more sophisticated modes of disseminating music during this period. 
to publish it and greater opportunity to travel. This meant that during this period, Beethoven was perhaps the first of the great 19th century composers to reach a much wider audience than any of his predecessors. The revolutionary zeal is reflected in Beethoven's music in the fact that everything he touched, all pre-existing genres, symphony, piano sonata, string quartet, overture, were transformed out of all recognition from past models. The one form where he was truly innovative and pioneering was the cello sonata, the duo for forte piano and violon cello. And it's on this genre that I want to focus our lecture. And thanks to the contribution from my wife, I'll not only talk about his cello sonatas, but you'll have a chance to hear some of the music played live. So, what is new about his cello sonatas? Well, of course, Beethoven didn't invent the idea of the cello sonata. They, were, they existed beforehand, but they were very different kinds of music. Before Beethoven, a cello sonata was either a display piece for the cello, uh, the best example of that is uh, the cello sonatas by uh, Luigi Boccherini, or it was a piece with two instrumental parts, usually solo cello, a second cello, and a harpsichord accompaniment. The harpsichord accompaniment would not be written out, it would be improvised through figures in the left hand. And the best example of that kind of cello sonata was Vivaldi. The difference between those earlier examples of cello sonatas and Beethoven's is that Beethoven's are true chamber pieces, with both cello and piano taking, taking on specific and inter interdependent roles. But did Beethoven's cello sonatas emerge entirely out of the blue? In one sense, the answer is yes, in that nothing like these works had been composed before. On the other hand, Beethoven had models for this kind of duo sonata, in particular Mozart. Mozart, his great pre predecessor, wrote 34 sonatas for piano and violin, and they were the kind of model on, on which his music was based. Now, let's look at these cello sonatas. For our purposes, there are only five such works, and that's terribly helpful because otherwise we would be here all night looking at the 32 piano sonatas or the 17 string quartets or the nine symphonies. Conveniently, also, they straddle the three periods of his life. The first two come from the first period, roughly speaking, 1784 to 1802. The third sonata from the middle period, 1802 to 1814. And the final two at the beginning of the late period, 1815 to 1827. Hopefully, my discussion of these works and the fact that you're going to have an opportunity to hear some excerpts of these works will illuminate the particular characteristics of each period and also support the idea of tradition and innovation. So, what or who initially inspired Beethoven to compose cello sonatas? Well, unusually in this case, it wasn't actually a performer. Normally, performers were the people that commissioned or aristocrats commissioned works. But in this case, it was King Frederick William II of Prussia. He was a fanatical music lover and an amateur cellist. He'd actually learned the viola de gamba, which was the uh, earlier example of the cello. And then when the cello became fashionable, he, he turned to the cello. And he wanted to make Berlin the cello capital of Europe. Indeed, so keen was he on the cello that he insisted on practicing two hours every day, something I wish uh, our students would do. <laughs> and he ordered a string quartet to accompany him on the battlefield so he could play string quartets while he was uh, engaging in military campaigns. That's quite extraordinary as well. And because uh, Frederick William had such ambitions for the cello, he wanted to commission the best composers to write music. In fact, he was uh, the commissioner of two important sets of string quartets by Haydn and Mozart. Now, of course, most string quartets had the first violin part as the, uh, the highest part, as the, as the most prominent. But in these cases, he made the specific requirement, the requirement that the cello parts should be difficult and challenging. And it was Frederick William II who commissioned Beethoven's first two cello sonatas in 17. The big influence on this was not so much um, Frederick William, but the cellists he'd engaged at his court. In particular, the two brothers, the Jean Pierre and Jean Louis Dupont from 
Paris. Jolly Dupont is particularly famous for writing a cello treatise that is still used today. The treatise is a kind of instruction manual on how to play the instrument effectively. And of course, since the cello is a relatively new instrument, there's a, a great demand for that kind of information. And we know that Dupont must have been a fantastic player because Voltaire said very famously, I quote, Monsieur Dupont, you make me believe in miracles. You can turn an ox into a nightingale. From anecdotal in information, we know that Jean-Louis Dupont struck up a very fruitful relationship with Beethoven. The two worked creative, creatively together to make these first two cello symphonies as effective and idiomatic as possible. And in fact, Dupont was very instrumental in helping Beethoven un better understand the capabil capabilities of the instrument. One of the interesting things is to look at the original score, and you see quite a lot of information in the cello part, which must have been contributed by Jean-Louis Dupont. Let's now look at the type of page of the uh, cello sonata. It's quite revealing in many respects. First of all, I suppose it's because Beethoven was a relatively unknown composer, it's perhaps not surprising that the king's name as a dedicatee should be a bigger type typeface than the composer. The second thing we notice is it's not called a cello sonata, but a sonata for keyboard with a supporting cello part, avec un violoncel obligé. So, in fact, it's suggesting that it's not a duo of equals, but the, the keyboard takes the, the leading role. And perhaps rather more surprisingly, because when you hear the music, you can't really believe this could be the case, the publisher claimed that the piano part could be played either on a 40 piano or a harpsichord. But if we look actually at the music, the part is far too complicated and has too wide a dynamic range to work on those old-fashioned instruments. So I would suggest that this title page was a bit of commercial expediency on the part of the publisher. Now, the formal structure of these early sonatas is very unconventional. <coughs> Normally, when we talk about a sonata in the classical period, it has three movements. A fast first movement, a slow middle movement, and then a fast primary movement. Beethoven <coughs> discards this idea. He opts for two movements. A slow introduction that leads to a fast movement, and then that is followed by another fast movement. Now, I want to focus on these slow introductions. Um, they're radically different and far more extensive than previous geosynthesis. There are a few examples in the past of, of slow introductions, and I'm going to play one of them now, or we're going to play one. Uh, this um, table on the screen summarizes the differences between one that I've chosen by Mozart, his B flat violin sonata, and Beethoven's Opus 5, number 1 cello sonata, the first of his cello sonatas. So, to illustrate this, let's hear the slow introduction debate to Mozart's B flat violin sonata, here transcribed for cello, which was written in 1784, so 11 years before Beethoven's. Let's just talk a little bit about it. Mozart writes slow, stately, but concise music with balanced, symmetrical patterns, shared equally between the two instruments, though the piano has the most showy material. The character of this music is lyrical, operatic, and elegant. So, let's now hear the introduction to the Mozart.
just to give you an idea of the um, context, we just have a little bit of the first section, so we need the, the continuity. So you don't just hear the introduction of what happens after. Now, let's go on to the Beethoven first sonata, written 11 years later. Well, the first striking difference is this is much longer. It's nearly three times the length. And whereas Mozart's music is symmetrical, it's beautiful, this is not a value judgment, um, Beethoven is much more un unpredictable. For a start, he opens the sonata quietly and unassumingly, unlike Mozart's big statement. But then the mood suddenly changes, disrupted by unexpected changes of harmony and character, as well as stark contrasting dynamics. What we're really hearing is an epic and dramatic emotion in Germany. And in this respect, the cello and the piano have very distinctive roles. Even if the piano part is more showy, the cello does take the lead in many cases. And perhaps one other thing that I want you to listen to is the preponderance of military rhythms. The rhythms that go bop, 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 bop. Because those military rhythms are clearly designed to flatter the military might of the king. And they're particularly obsessive in this, in this rhythm. So, here we'll hear the slow introduction to Beethoven's Opus 5 tonight. So, I think you can hear quite a significant difference between the Mozart and Beethoven. They travelled a long way in, in music. But Beethoven was even bolder in his second sonata. Um, the introduction to that, which we will hear at the next one, he surpasses the originality of the first sonata. Perhaps we assume, maybe, 
misleading. He actually wrote this work after writing the first sonata. There's no evidence either way. But it, it seems to mark an even more of a departure from the convention. For a start, it's laid out on an even grander, more dramatically intense scale. In fact, we won't have time to hear, hear all of it today. Part of the reason for that is the work is, is cast in a minor, minor key. It's cast in a minor key and imbued with far greater pathos. We thought that juxtapositions were unpredictable in the F sonata, but here they're even more unpredictable. Uh, Beethoven cuts off phrases without any logic necessary. And there's even more obsessive use of military rhythms, those bop, 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 bop. And perhaps most significantly of all, the cello and the piano are regarded more as equals than in the F minus. So here's the introduction to the G minor. Joe, that was great. Now, everyone, go and watch part two. Eric's going to take us through Beethoven's great personal crisis, showing us its transformational effect on his musical development. He and Joe will give us some insights into the musical riches of three more cello sonatas. See you in part two. <laughs>